Oh, gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you and we magnify you. We thank you for the opportunity and the blessing to be able to come here together in your name to worship you. And so we come and assemble to lift up our voices and our hearts, to look at your word, to open our ears, to be able to hear what it is that you have to say for us. We humble ourselves before you, O oh Lord God, for we are weak because of our sinfulness and we depend completely on the blood of Jesus that was shed on the cross for our sins. Please forgive us for our sins. Please take away the burdens we carry on our hearts. Take them away now, if only for a moment, that we might be able to hear clearly what your Spirit has for us from your Word. Be with us, Lord, for your name and for your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please turn in your Bibles to Luke chapter 3. And I still want to spend a little bit of time on this passage, which is a, a quote that is applied to John the Baptist. But it is a quote from Isaiah, and so I want to look at that and see what it uh, means for us and how it applies for us. If you remember from last week, I believe that we follow in the, the steps of those who have come before us from the Old Testament prophets to John the Baptist, to Jesus, to the church, and to us as the present today church that we have, carry, we have the responsibility to carry on this uh, task of proclaiming forth the Word of God. And so today, I want to focus on the idea of making a highway for our God. Making a highway for our God. And that phrase there comes from the Isaiah passage, which we will read in a moment. But I would like for us to begin in Luke chapter 3, and I'm going to start in verse 1. Now in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, Pontius Pilate being governor of Judea, Herod being Tetrarch of Galilee, his brother Philip, Tetrarch of Iturea, and the region of Trachonitis, and Lysanias, Tetrarch of Abilene. While Annas and Caiaphas were high priests, the word of God came to John, the son of Zechariah, in the wilderness. And he went into all the region around the Jordan, preaching a baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. As it is written in the book of the words of Isaiah the prophet, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness... Prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. Every valley shall be filled, and every mountain and hill brought low. The crooked places shall be made straight, and the rough ways smooth. And all flesh shall see the salvation of God. Then he said to the multitudes that came out to be baptized by him, Brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Therefore bear fruits worthy of repentance, and do not begin to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our father. For I say to you that God is able to raise up children to Abraham from these stones. And even now the axe is laid to the root of the trees. Therefore every tree which does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. So this is the message of John the Baptist. In verse 3 it says, He went into all of the region around Jordan and he preached a baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. This was his message. It was a message of repentance so that people could experience the forgiveness of sins. And so he went out into the wilderness, as we saw last week. He went out into the wilderness to proclaim this truth. He took the water to the wilderness, of the, the spiritual wilderness that's out there, of people who are laden down with sins and struggling with the burdens that sinfulness brings in this world. And so that is part of our task. We are to take the water of the Word, if you will, in this case, out into the wilderness and proclaim it forth. And as we do that, we are to prepare the way of the Lord. To prepare the way of the Lord. Now, this passage here is a quote from Isaiah 40, and I would like to uh, take a moment and read from there. So you can turn real fast to Isaiah chapter 40 in your Bibles, and I'm going to read the passage from Isaiah and uh, you'll see where I get to the, the title for the sermon this morning. Isaiah chapter 40, beginning of verse 1, 1 through 5. And, um, and listen to the verses around uh, the passage that is quoted in Luke. It says, Comfort, yes, comfort my people, says your God. Speak comfort to Jerusalem and cry out to her that her warfare is ended, that her iniquity is pardoned, for she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. 
The voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be exalted and every mountain and hill brought low. The crooked places shall be made straight and the rough places smooth. The glory of the Lord shall be revealed in all flesh, shall see it together for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. So what a great passage. It is a passage of comfort. So here you are, you have people who are laden down with sin, who are burdened with sin, who have chosen to sin against God, and yet they have turned, and because they have turned, because they have repented, the prophet comes with a message of comfort. Comfort my people. Her warfare is ended, her iniquity is pardoned. What a great passage there, and that truly brings comfort to us. And so this passage here, is the passage that is used in Luke chapter 3 to speak of the ministry of John the Baptist and hence the, the, the ministry of the church. And so we have prepare a highway for, the God, for our God, which is from verse 3, Isaiah 40, verse 3 there. Now, as we, we can go back to Luke now, but as we uh, go forth with the message into the wilderness, there are some things that we have to uh, kind of set up or established in our minds as we understand what's happening here. So notice, first of all, he says, here, here's John the Baptist. He goes out in the wilderness, and this is his message. Prepare the way of the Lord. Make his path straight. Prepare the way of the Lord. Make his paths straight. And what does that mean? It means that the Lord is on his way. The Lord is coming. The Lord is coming. Get ready. He is coming. Prepare the way of the Lord. Make his paths straight. So the Lord is coming. Now we know as Christians, we know that Jesus promised when he rose and ascended, he promised that he was going to return, right? He's going to return and, uh, and we would see him. And so this is the herald of that promise. Now, of course, John the Baptist was right before the first coming of Jesus. And in the first coming of Jesus, uh, he, was, he was right there. And so John proclaimed it, that he was coming. And they were to prepare the way for him. And part of preparing that way was the, the, mis- the ministry, that message of repentance. Look, the Lord is going to come. And unless you repent of your sins, basically, you're not going to see it. You're going to miss it. And that's one of the tragedies of all the Gospels. You know, you read through the Gospels and it's, it's amazing how, uh, you know, on the one hand, you had the crowds just kind of flocking after him, right? And you would kind of expect that. You would expect this multitude of people just to follow him and be his disciples. But the same throng turned around and yelled, crucify him. And at the end, you only have maybe a hundred people who follow Jesus initially. The people missed it. They didn't see it. They didn't truly repent. Not all of them, anyways. And so Jesus came and he ministered, and we'll talk more about that in a moment. But here we are. We're standing in the same place. Jesus is returning, right? And we don't know when he's going to come. I mean, there are some things that must take place, as we are told in, in the Scripture. There are some things that must take place, but, but really God can move circumstances and events, and he can come back right away. And uh, even if he chooses not to come here immediately, there is the possibility that we will pass from here and meet him. And not necessarily going up either. You know what I mean? Death, death brings us face to face with our Creator. And so, are we ready for that? Are we prepared? And that is the message. Prepare the way of the Lord. We will meet him soon. He is on his way. But there's a sense in which Jesus is coming now. When we, when we talk about the, the message of the gospel and we're talking about, you know, believe in Jesus and ask for the forgiveness of sins, there's a sense in which when we do that, he comes to us. As it says in Colossians, and here's our first passage I have here out on the screen. It says, uh, he says, you therefore have received Christ. So Christ is coming. You have received him. You have received Christ, Jesus the Lord. So walk in him. And so, so here it is, we proclaim the message of the gospel, and there are people who do not know Jesus. But when they believe in him and ask for the forgiveness of sins, and, they, and he comes and he changes their lives, he comes to them. They have prepared the way, and he has come to them. And so we, like John the Baptist, proclaim the message, prepare the way of the Lord. He is coming to you. Are you ready to meet him? So one way or the other, he is coming to you. 
Now, here's the great thing, because as we move to the end, well, great for us, but not so great for a lot of people. As we come to the end, we see verses that reflect the fact that everybody will meet Jesus at some point. There's nobody who's excluded from this. So, in Revelation chapter 1, verse 7, for example, it says, Behold, He is coming with clouds, and you see what it says next? Every eye will see Him. Even they who pierced Him. So it's like His appearing to everybody is not just an appearing to those who are His. It is an appearing to everybody, even the ones who murdered Him. He will appear to everyone. No one is excluded from that. And that makes the message of the Gospel all the more urgent. All the more urgent for us to receive its message and all the more urgent for us to proclaim its message for others to receive. Because every eye will see Him, even the ones who are, were against Him and pierced Him. All the tribes of the earth will mourn because of Him. Even so, amen. Why do the tribes of the earth mourn? They mourn because they missed their opportunity and there He is and they have not accepted Him and there will be mourning. It's sort of like now you have on the news, you know, with all the virus and the virus D, version D coming out and uh, um, what they're playing on the news are those people who get the virus and said, I should have gotten the vaccination. You know, I, they got the virus. I should have gotten the vaccination. I am not promoting the vaccination. I'm just repeating what they're saying there. In, in other words, they got the virus, and after getting it, they're feeling that um, they should have gotten, they should have prepared themselves. I, I did get the virus shot, by the way, but I'm not promoting it. That is your decision. And I know there's a huge debate um, raging out there, but uh, whatever. <laughs> Follow your own conscience there before the Lord, and uh, He'll take care of us. And um, So anyway, I, I'm not promoting rebellion or anything like that. I did get the shot myself, you know, but there it is. And uh, the thought of wearing a mask again, uh, oh my goodness, I just hate that. I hate wearing those masks. Every time I wear my mask, the, my nose runs. And uh, All right, we won't go into details. There's no need for that either. But uh, the point is this. You have the virus, and uh, there's this uh, shot that they're saying is available for us, and some people choose not to get it, but then they get the virus, and they wish they had gotten it. And this is what the, re the appearing of the Lord is going to be. I heard about Jesus, but I didn't believe. And then he's going to appear... But then it's too late, he has appeared, and they will mourn. That's what it's saying there. So, Revelation chapter 1, verse 7, another verse, Matthew chapter 24, verse 30. This is Jesus. <clears throat> Matthew chapter 24 and 25 have a lot uh, to say about the end times. And in this particular verse, he says, Then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven, and then... And look what it says. All the tribes of the earth will mourn and they will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. That will be a terrifying day for those who do not believe in Jesus. But it will be a glorious day of deliverance for us who do believe in Him. Praise the Lord for that. But the point here at the moment is that all the tribes of the earth, they will see Him and they will mourn. So Jesus is coming back. We are here to proclaim the message in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, because He is returning and everyone will see Him. He is coming to you and to me, and therefore we must be prepared. So, then He goes into this great imagery here, beginning in verse 5. Every valley will be filled. And here's the picture I had last week. This, this, is a, this is the wilderness of Judea. Just one of the pictures. Of course, uh, I picked the roughest picture I could find. It's not all this rough, but it gives you the, the idea of what the wilderness is like over there. So, every valley shall be filled. Every mountain and hill will be brought low. The crooked places shall be made straight, and the rough places smooth. 
This is what it means to prepare the way of the Lord. This is what stands for the life of a person laden with sin. It is like this. And what there needs to be, there needs to be a repenting of sin to turn the wilderness into a highway for our God so that we are ready to receive Him. What a transformation, right? We can, we can take all of this rough terrain and we can just smooth it out as if we were playing in our sandbox and we can make this highway. And that's what we're supposed to do. This, this is not speaking of some little, uh, you know, this little, okay, yeah, I believe in God kind of thing. This is talking about a transformation of the heart and of the mind. It is talking about the, the changing of the life to be ready for Jesus. And of course, you know, we don't want to forget that this is the work of the Lord. We proclaim it, but He brings the fruit. And so this is the work of the Spirit of God that goes forth and penetrates the heart and convicts the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. So that we have the opportunity to change our wilderness into a highway for the Lord. Now, of course, when we're talking about the mountains and we're talking about the valleys and we're talking about the crooked and the and the rough road, we're, we're talking about ultimately, we're talking about sin. It is sin that needs to be taken care of. It was a message of repentance that the Old Testament prophets preached. Repent. You have not been living like God would have you live. And remember, I, I know I'm preaching out here to us, but we're the ones who bear this message. If you're here and you believe in Jesus, I, I'm not preaching that you would ask for you know, salvation. I am, I am reminding us that we have this message that we are to take out there to the people whose lives look like this so that they can get ready like this. That's our job. So we're talking about a world who is full of sin that causes all, all of this trouble. And so we preach repentance that they might begin to prepare this highway for the Lord because He's coming back. And so it is a message that we proclaim that, that involves acting. So, I mean, John the Baptist, you know that you know we just read it this morning, well, part of it anyways, um, he, he wasn't just saying repent and believe as if, you know, they didn't have to do anything except say, okay, I believe and say a prayer and that was the end of it. It was repent. What does that mean? Well, He said, to, he said, if you have two tunics, give one. If uh, the tax collectors, they said, don't take more than, than, than you should. To the soldiers, he says, don't intimidate anyone or accuse anybody falsely. Be content with your wages. And so, you know, there's some really practical changes that these people needed to, to make in their lives to show that they were true about their repentance. So it wasn't just kind of a head acknowledgement. It was a head acknowledgement and a heart acknowledgement that was to result in actual changes in their life. Repent. And so, it is a message, the message that we proclaim, it is a message to act. So when we take the gospel to them, we say to believe, we are calling them to believe and to actually make changes in their lives. Now, uh, don't get me wrong, I, we, we shouldn't wait. If someone is making a decision for Christ, we, do, we should never say, go get your life straightened out first and then believe in Jesus. I, I don't think that that's appropriate or proper. It is, you know, you preach, believe in Jesus, and as you believe, you go make the changes. I mean, don't wait. It, it's like the person who does not come to church until they make sure they get their life right. Have you ever come across somebody like that? Well, you know, there's just too many. I have too much baggage. There's too much stuff in my life. Uh, when I get it all straightened out, then I'll come to church. There's so many people like that. And why, do they, why is that? Because really, when it comes down to it, they know that their life looks a lot like this. And they don't feel worthy to come to a place like this. If only they would come and see us, right? and realize that we're just like them. We're not very much different than them, except, you know, we believe in Christ and trust in Him for the forgiveness of sins. But, you know, the world a lot of times has this lofty, holier-than-thou view of us. Should they feel like that? What do you think? 
don't raise your hand. We will counsel with each other, and I will uh, set the counseling uh, time. If you, if you think that we're better than they, and they should not come here. There, 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 there's a, we're proclaiming the gospel. This is the place. This is like going to the hospital. This is the spiritual hospital, right? Let them come, and we will love them. As long as they keep loving Jesus and are seeking to do what is right, we will love them, and we will help them in their transformation of the wilderness. And really, this is part of the message. He said, prepare the way of the Lord. They said, what shall we do? And what did he do? He didn't say, go figure it out yourself. He told them what to do. He helped them in that. He gave them direction, and that's where we come in as a body of believers. We are to help them. So when we talk about some of these things, I just wanted to point out some of the the imagery again. We talk about the mountains here. This is huge in Isaiah. In Isaiah, he talks about how the mountains stand for pride. So it says, For the day of the Lord of hosts shall come upon everything proud and lofty, everything lifted up, and it shall be brought low. In verse 14, two verses later, it says, Upon the high mountains and upon the high, all the, the hills that are lifted up. So what you have in Isaiah, he will often use the mountains and the hills, as in this verse. He will often use the big trees that are growing up to the sky. He will use them as a symbol of pride and loftiness. And this is one thing in the wilderness of the people is this idea, this pride. In spite of their sin and in spite of the trouble they have in their life, there's a certain pride that goes along with it for some reason. And they'll say proud things like, well, I don't need God. God is for the weak. I'm doing okay on my own, thank you. I'm a pretty good person. Hey, you believe and worse things are happening to you than they are to me. They'll, see, they'll say things like that. And what they're doing in each of these statements, they're just reflecting the pride of their heart and putting up a wall against God. I don't need God. I don't want God. That is something that needs to be brought down. You have the blind, of course. In Isaiah 42, verse 16, he says, I will bring the blind by a way they did not know. I will lead them in paths they have not known. I will make darkness light for them. You remember that was part of the imagery that we saw that uh, not only is the world a wilderness, but the world lies in darkness, right? You remember that? So he says, I will make darkness light before them and crooked places straight. These things I will do for them. And not forsake them. You see, this this is God's heart. He wants the people to bring down every mountain. He wants the people to raise up the valleys. He wants the people to make a straight way and to make a smooth way. That's what God wants. That's why he sent John the Baptist. Now, you know, we can criticize, people criticize John the Baptist for his message being so strong. But at least it was a message sent from God to the people. Because he cared for them. He wanted them to hear it. He wanted them to repent. And so that should be our heart too. We are taking the message out there not to judge them and to tear them down, but to give them an offer of hope of eternal life. We are going out there to help them bring their mountain down, to help them fill up their valleys, to help them make that highway. That is our job. So you have these blind people and they cannot see God. And uh, they believe in the scientists rather than in what God has said. You know, anybody who believes in evolution is choosing to believe the scientists because they haven't figured it out for themselves. They're believing what the scientists have said rather than what God has said. So it's an issue of faith all the way around. They cannot see God. They have eyes to see, but they cannot see He also comes to deliver the imprisoned soul. In Isaiah chapter 45, verse 2, it says, I will go before you and make the crooked places straight. I will break in pieces the gates of bronze and cut the bars of iron. What a great verse that is. People are imprisoned in these bars of their thoughts and their emotions and their health and their circumstances of their life. They are imprisoned. 
And I know how easy it is to get into a situation where you feel like you are imprisoned. But God is greater than any prison. He is stronger than any iron bar, and he can cut it as if it was a piece of grass. And so we go forward and we proclaim this deliverance to the world. Now, if if we're only talking about the forgiveness of sins, then the only message that we have is repent and be forgiven of your sins, much like what John the Baptist said. That's what he did, right? He went out there and he said, repent and believe and, uh, and then, you know, show some fruits of your repentance and then come and I'll baptize you. That's what John the Baptist said. He preached Repentance, he preached this preparation. But Jesus was so much more than John the Baptist was. Jesus and John were not even in the same ballpark. John was a great prophet, the last of the prophets of the Old Testament, the Old Covenant. But Jesus was so much greater. When John said, I am not worthy to unloose the strap of his sandal, he was not just expressing a mere sentiment. That was absolutely true. John wasn't even close to Jesus. And when Jesus went about preaching, he did not just preach forgiveness. He preached forgiveness, but then he healed the blind man of his blindness. And he raised the person from the dead. And he healed the lame man, so that he could walk. And in each act of deliverance, he gave a foretaste of the kingdom to come. And you know, we we come forward and we have this same message, and really it is a message of hope and joy and freedom. We are to take this message of repentance and we are to attach it to the lives of the people that are out there. We should be concerned for every mountain and every valley and every crooked way and every stony way that we encounter in the lives of people out there. We should look for that and see it and not shy away from it. We have the message of life. Amen? Do you believe that? We have the message of light. Amen? Do we believe that? Do we believe that? Some of you believe that. I know it's hard for us to grasp sometimes, but our message is a message of life. It is a message of light. It is the truth. And Jesus, of course, is all of those things. Thank you, Pam. Praise the Lord, right? Jesus is the way, the life, the light, the truth, and we carry the message of Jesus to this world. And so it is a message of getting right with God, but it is a message of God being involved and impacting people in their lives. In Isaiah chapter 61, verses 1 through 3, you can turn there with me if you want. Isaiah 61, and this is another prophecy concerning the coming of Christ. Isaiah 61, Jesus quotes this passage when he's in the synagogue and he is asked to read from Isaiah. He quotes parts of this passage. So it says in Isaiah 61, and he applies it to himself. Isaiah 61, 1, the Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to preach good tidings to the poor. Now, now listen to what it says here. He's here to preach good tidings to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, the opening of the prison to those who are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, to console those who mourn in Zion, to give them beauty for ashes and the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they may be called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he may be glorified. So look, we take the preaching 
of good tidings, the gospel to the people. But when we come across the brokenhearted, when we come across the captive, when we come across those who are bound, when we come across those who are mourning, we should preach the word in order to comfort them and to deliver them and to heal them and to free them from their bounds. Our message is, is, is a complete message. And praise the Lord, you have... Now, the world, I mean, the church has picked this up throughout the centuries, and so you have a lot of the people in the church. And even today, you can go around to different churches, and you have some churches who are... are uh, they have soup kitchens, and they have clothing closets, and they have other you know, prison ministries. And, and these are the attempts to take the message of the truth to the people where they are hurting. And that is, that is right. You know, we should, we should participate and be involved in those things as much as possible. Um, we also have to make sure that we speak these things, that we speak the truth of the gospel. It, it doesn't help very much if we give them soup, but we don't tell them about Jesus. They'll just eat the soup and be thankful and continue on in their sins. Nor does it help, and James really brings this out, nor does it help if we say, well, I hope everything gets better to you, and we send them away. I, I hope everything gets better for you, and we send them away, but we don't offer them any help. So, you know, we can't just speak the message, and we can't just help the need. We have to, to do both. We have to speak the message and help the need. And a lot of times, the speaking of the message goes along with the, he, the helping of the need. So we're there like Jesus did to set the captive free to comfort those who mourn. And, and now, of course, remember that ultimately all of this comes from asking Him to forgive of our sins. I mean, that is the dead weight that sits on the unbeliever's heart. The, the sin is the biggest burden that needs to be taken care of. But it is attached to their life. And so we must proclaim the truth into their life. Isaiah 35. Let's back up a little bit. Isaiah chapter 35. And again, we see some of what this means. Isaiah 35. Beginning in verse 1. It says, The wilderness and the wasteland shall be glad for them. And the desert shall rejoice and blossom as the rose. It shall blossom abundantly and rejoice, even with joy and singing. The glory of Lebanon shall be given to it, the excellence of Carmel and Sharon. They shall see the glory of the Lord, the excellency of our God. Strengthen the weak hands and make firm the feeble knees. Say to those who are fearful hearted, be strong, do not fear. Behold, your God will come with a vengeance. With the recompense of God, he will come and save you. Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened, and the ears of the deaf shall be unstopped. Then the lame shall leap like a deer, and the tongue of the dumb sing. For waters shall burst forth in the wilderness, and streams in the desert. The parched ground shall become a pool, and the thirsty land springs of water. In the habitation of jackals where each lay, there shall be grass with reeds and rushes. A highway shall be there, and a road, and it shall be called the highway of holiness. The unclean shall not pass over it, but it shall be for others. Whoever walks the road, although a fool shall not go astray, no lion shall be there, nor shall any ravenous beast go upon it. It shall not be found there, but the redeemed shall walk there. And the ransomed of the Lord shall return and come to Zion with singing, with everlasting joy on their heads. They shall obtain joy and gladness, and sorrow and sighing shall flee away. So, O oh church, this morning our message is to take the way of the gospel into the wilderness, to proclaim it in this world, and to be ready in the proclamation to transform this into this by the grace of God. And so let us proclaim it. Let us offer help. Let us bring the good news of Jesus Christ. Let us bring that news of joy and comfort to those out there who need it. They need it. Just as we have needed it. Just as we continue to need it today. Amen?
So if you're here this morning as we sing our final song, I would encourage you for, to ask, I would encourage you to ask the Lord if you, uh, uh, if you need help yourself, if you have some uh, wilderness clearing that needs to take place in your life, ask the Lord for His help. But let us also ask the Lord for opportunities to take the message of the truth out there. And as we proclaim it with our mouths, let us serve the people with, their, with our hands and let us meet their needs even as we tell them of the deliverance and the forgiveness that comes through Jesus Christ. Let's stand. If you have a prayer request, of course, you can come on up. I'd be glad to pray with you. Uh, we have a couple of seats up here. We have some seats up there. If you want to come and pray on your own, or you can come and kneel up at the front. However the Lord is leading you, let's uh, take this opportunity to allow Him to minister to us, even as we lift our voices in praise one more time.